Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. We can go ahead and drop the uh, cover slide. Hi there. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Psychology and LGBT Plus Legislative Advocacy 2022, Resources for Grassroots and State Level Advocacy. I'm Ron Schlittler. I'm the Assistant Director of the Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity Portfolio here at the American Psychological Association. We have more than 885 registrants today, and we're very pleased to have those of you who are able to join us live. The session is being recorded and will be shared with everyone who registered within about a week. You are welcome to submit questions at any time or comments uh, by using the questions button. There will be a brief survey after the webinar, webinar that we hope you will take a few minutes to complete to let us know how we did and how we can improve. We will also have two polls today. The first will be in a couple of minutes to assess where folks are in terms of your sense of competence and confidence to engage in advocacy regarding state legislation. Then we'll have another one near the end to uh, reassess. One other note, APA recently instituted a strategy to promote cultural, a, a culture of healthy and productive meetings and to improve everyone's well-being. Central to that strategy is to avoid back-to-back -back meetings with no time in between, so by, by ending meetings a few minutes early. Therefore, this webinar will be scheduled for an hour and a half. We will strive to give you back the last 10 minutes. You can learn more about this strategy with a link to meetings with purpose that will be provided toward the end of the webinar. And now with that, I'll hand it over to my co-host, Kim Skirvin. Kim? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Skirvin. I am co-chair of the Public Policy Committee for the Society uh, for Sexual, for the well, <laughs> Society for Psychology of Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity. Sorry about that. Um, we're also known as APA's Division 44. And uh, Dr. Katie Trotta is my co-chair. She's gonna be helping with some of the behind the scenes things going on today in the presentation. And also with uh, your questions during the discussion time. I also want to reiterate how pleased we are with the high level of interest in today's webinar. It really certainly speaks to the importance of this topic. So today's program is going to include a few things. First of all, we're going to have an update on the state of LGBTQ plus related legislative activity around the country by Kate Oakley of the Human Rights Campaign. And then after that, we're going to hear from Dr. Rosemary Essex uh, with the Nebraska Psychological Association and Dr. Megan Mooney with the Texas Psychological Association. They're going to be sharing some of their experiences with advocacy in action in their respective states. This will be followed by an introduction to advocacy skills and opportunities by Doris Parfait Claude from the APA Advocacy Office. We'll wrap up the presentations with an overview of the web-based advocacy resources by Sergio Dominguez, myself, and Katie. This content was developed in partnership with the APA Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity Portfolio, the APA uh, Division 44 Public Policy Committee, and the Advocacy Office, uh, with updates by Sergio for our 2022 content. We will then conclude with some time for discussion and questions and answers with our presenters. I'd also like to acknowledge the staff of APA's Office of Membership and Engagement for providing the amazing production and promotional support for, today, for today's webinar. We sure couldn't do it without them. Now with that, we'll run the first poll to gauge your assessment of your own competence and confidence in engaging uh, with, with advocacy um, at the state level. Good. Well, it looks like uh, from what I'm seeing as the numbers come in that there's a kind of you're falling a little bit into the I've got some confidence and competence, but I sure could use to gain a little bit more. <laughs> Any thoughts on yeah. it, Kim? Yeah, it's a room to grow is what I'm seeing. It's wonderful. Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Kate Oakley. She is the state legislative director and senior counsel at the Human Rights Campaign. She's going to help us understand what's happening around the country this year with legislation that is affecting LGBTQ plus people and communities. So I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Hello, everyone. And I'm going to just quickly do, run through a few slides. We're not going to do too many things here, but um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kate Oakley. I'm the State Legislative Director and Senior Counsel at HRC, which means that I 
Um, I'm a policy attorney. Um, policy is my is my shtick. And I also help oversee uh, HRC's extensive state legislative program where we're working in virtually every state um, against literally hundreds of bills, as you'll see in just a second. Um, and occasionally four bills too, although these days not so many for and more against, unfortunately. Um, this is just for a little bit of context what the state legislation has looked like on LGBTQ issues in the last few years. So that um, purple line up on top, that's how many good bills have been introduced, how many pro-equality bills have been introduced. And the red line is how many anti-equality bills have been introduced. And then those bars on the bottom show how many of those bills in fact passed. So the purple um, is how many good bills. And again, the red is how many bad bills. So you could see that there was a period of time where we had a lot more good bills introduced, um, a pretty steady number of bad bills um, introduced, and not a ton of action on that bad bill side. And then starting in 2015, things really exploded. And then starting in 2020, we had a sort of a secondary explosion, which we continue to be in right now. That secondary explosion has really been driven by attacks on transgender youth. Um, in 2020, we set a record for 79 anti-transgender bills introduced across the country. We then more than doubled that number or just about doubled that number in 2021 with 149 anti-transgender bills introduced. So this is not anti-LGBTQ, this is anti-transgender. Um, and these specifically were looking at um, trans kids playing sports, trans kids being able to receive gender affirming medical care, um, and even in some cases, bathrooms. That was all a precursor, unfortunately, to what we've been seeing this year in 2022. This year, we're tracking 565 bills across the country. About 132 of those are our support. These are all estimates. I know they look like specific numbers, but they change um, constantly. So consider them, please, all to be under counts. Um, and rough numbers for the purposes of our conversation, um, and more than 300 bills that we oppose. And we're opposing bills all across the country. Of those, about 126 specifically are targeting transgender folks, and in particular doing that through the healthcare bans and the sports bans. Um, we're also seeing a huge uptick in bills that are discriminating against um, LGBTQ youth in education. As of this precise moment, we have um, two bad bills that have already been signed into law. In Iowa and South Dakota, anti-trans sports bans have been signed into law. And we have a good bill that was signed into law in New Jersey, which is um, modernizing their HIV um, criminalization law. Um, and then we have five bills as of this moment um, that it's actually six bills because this has changed since I made the slide this morning. Um, we now have six bills that are in front of governors to be signed. In Florida, we have the Don't Say Gay or Trans Bill, which you may have heard about. It's been getting a lot of press, as well as the, quote, Stop Woke Act, which is now also in front of the governor after having been passed through the Senate this afternoon. Um, there's a sports bill for Indiana, which um, is uh, in front of the governor for his signature. Um, we also have a curriculum censorship bill in South Dakota waiting for Governor Nome's signature. An anti-trans sports ban in Utah that we are, uh, we believe will be vetoed and also a bill in Wisconsin that would allow school districts to refuse to use um, students' chosen name and pronouns. Um, again, the governor is expected to veto that bill as well. Um, I see that folks are maybe a little bit new to legislative advocacy, and I, um, my presentation portion here it will be wrapping up just in a second, but I will be on to talk about, um, uh, to answer questions for folks who have them. And I do want to encourage you, even if you don't think of yourself as a professional legislative person, um, one of the things that I think is really important in terms of advocacy for LGBTQ folks is just speak to what you know. I mean, you don't have to know everything about everything. A lot of these issues are complex. The legislative process can be complex. I promise you the legislators who are purporting to be experts on these bills are not experts on these bills. 
um, people who are actual experts um, absolutely need to be part of these conversations. And so even if you're speaking to just a small area of expertise, please understand that you know stuff the legislators don't know and that you can be really helpful in terms of contributing to that conversation. There are lots of different ways that you can um, get engaged and we can talk about ways that I can hook you up with HRC products to, to stay engaged about what's happening in the states. But one of the things that I just really want to reiterate is that just showing up for the community is a really big deal. And one thing that in particular, uh, we've been thinking a lot about, um, particularly as things have been uh, developing in Texas in a way I'm sure that folks have heard, um, you know, we're really concerned about what it means for some of these families to step into the limelight and share their stories. And so to be able to be there to support them, to be able to be there and take some of the pressure off them, that is incredibly important. Um, some of the states that we are the most concerned about in this moment, in addition to the states that were on that previous slide, are Alabama and Idaho, both of which are considering passing gender affirming uh, bans on gender affirming medical care that would actually inflict felony penalties um, on providers and in Idaho's case also parents. Um, and we're also very concerned about uh, a list of other states, including Arizona, Ohio, that are also considering that kind of legislation, as well as some states that are continuing to consider um, anti-trans sports bills and other things. So I'm happy to answer questions, but um, I do want to just sort of lay out that what's happening now in the states is an all-out attack, um, particularly on transgender youth. And it's our third year of trans youth really being under the microscope and the seventh year of the LGBTQ community fighting really, really hard in the states. Even as we're talking about good developments happening at the federal level, we cannot stop fighting at the states. The states is where our opposition is bringing the fight to us. And so um, we have to continue to be really engaged there. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm such a proud partner with you all and um, happy to answer questions if there are any. And Ron, with that, I send it back to you. Great, Kate. Thank you for that important, if alarming, and disconcerting <laughs> review. <laughs> and thank you for agreeing to stay with us for the rest of the program and join the discussion time. I'd like, not, like now to invite Drs. Uh, Rosemary Essex and Megan Mooney to share with us some of their experiences engaging in advocacy over at least several years now uh, in their own states. Rosemary, would you like to get us started? Okay. Yeah, so I'm Rose Essex. I'm with the Nebraska State Psychological Association. And uh, as was mentioned, you don't have to be a professional advocate. So I'm here to represent unprofessional advocacy. Sorry, that's probably more non-professional advocacy. Yeah, I'm just a member of my state association. I don't have a title. I just kind of married into the state association in 1997. Small state associations like a small high school, everybody does everything. Uh, so I first got involved with advocacy with reproductive rights. Um, things tend to come up pretty quickly. A bill gets proposed, it's in the news, isn't time for the board to meet. So there's an email that goes around with board members saying, gee, we ought to speak out against this. Who could speak? Well, um, Rose teaches a class on that, right? Dan, would you ask Rose? So yeah, so I don't have a title. I don't even have a last name. I'm just Rose, would you write something? Um, and I got involved in LGBTQ advocacy when a close friend passed away in the middle of a particularly, a fight against a particularly boneheaded conscience clause. So what will tend to happen is I hear about something on the radio. I ask the board via email, um, could I present testimony or could I write a letter to the editor? I uh, hate, kind of hate to say this in front of Megan who's had a different experience, but uh, we don't have a lot of opposition or a lot, not a lot of formal opposition. You know, it's the planes, there's not a lot of us. So it's kind of passive aggressive opposition, but you know, people don't say much to your face. So I'll write testimony or letters to the editor at night, um, uh, uh, solicit input from Ron, who's been very helpful, send a draft out to the board. The board says, fine, go ahead, do it. Uh, so I have drafts on several issues that I kind of tweak as the situation calls for uh, expanding uh, rights protection um, to, for, to cover sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, supporting school district efforts to be more inclusive for non-binary kids, and most recently efforts to ban conversion therapy. Um, obviously my testimony focuses on the mental health implications of whether people do or do not feel supported by their communities. In my clinical job, um, 
LGBTQ outreach is a part of suicide prevention. So I tend to lean pretty heavily on that. Uh, so then I testify if I can. Uh, my employer is, my clinical employer is very supportive of LGBTQ rights, but not supportive of me doing anything other than working for them. So if it's on one of my teaching days, I can testify in person. Uh, if it's not, then I, we can submit written testimony, or as I mentioned, letters to the editor, or um, I, um, it, most recently, I got somebody to testify on my behalf. So our re most recent thing was a city council, Lincoln city council measure, uh, proposing to ban conversion therapy for minors. Um, I heard about it on the news, asked the board, can we uh, be in support? Board said, sure. I approached the city council member who proposed it and said, would you like the state association to uh, support you? And he said, well, yes, that would be nice. So I wrote my testimony. Um, couldn't uh, actually testify at the meeting, but um, Evan McCracken, a graduate student who'd helped me with previous testimony, was willing to testify, and we won that one, which just boggled the mind. So yeah, statewide lost, but it won um, within the city of Lincoln. So yeah, so again, you don't have to be full-time, just do what you can, help where you can. Every now and then it occurs to me, gee, is this really how laws get made um, by doofuses, you know, input with doofuses like me? Um, yes, that is how law get, laws get made, and that kind of explains a bit about our, our system of government. So that's the news from Nebraska. Thanks, Rose. Yeah, I mean, so Rose and I were comparing notes the other day, and, and we're interested in all the different ways that we can do advocacy at our state levels. So hi, everybody. I'm Megan Mooney. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the past president of the Texas Psychological Association, and I'm one of our federal advocacy advocacy coordinators coordinating with APA. Um, so my journey is sort of an interesting one um, in terms of all my different kind of advocacy hats and, and my journey to a little bit more uh, spotlight on me at the moment here in Texas, um, because as Kate referenced a little bit ago, Texas is a, a tough state for our, our LGBTQ plus community um, and has been for a number of years. Um, so, you know, my, my advocacy work kind of started within TPA actually, uh, kind of helping to make sure that our board was aware of things like the amicus brief uh, in support of marriage equality uh, at a national level, and then making sure that as um, anti-LGBTQ bills were starting to come through more and more through the Texas legislature, that we were paying attention to that. Um, because really, you know, we need to keep this lens of discriminatory legislation is a problem for all people, whether we're talking about for us as psychologists, for the clients we serve, or for our greater communities. Um, I'm by, by trade a child and adolescent psychologist, and so I'm focused in particular on LGBTQ plus young people. I'm also a trauma specialist um, through the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and so that particular intersection of my interests is what makes me very passionate about uh, legislation that seeks to harm young people and their families. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to kind of highlight for folks today is that we have to show up because because if we don't, somebody else will be there. Um, so either it will be people trying to seek to harm our communities, harm our children, or give bad information. And so that's been one of my most valuable experiences in, in testifying at the Texas legislature over a number of years now, is sitting and watching um, from the gallery what other people are saying about my community and about my clients. And I've really learned that we have to be present. We have to be there to speak up about psychology and science and facts and mental health and how this relates to protecting rights for people. Um, because other people will be there and will cite either outdated information or blatantly discriminatory, transphobic and homophobic information. And as Kate referenced, our legislators are not experts on these things. They are relying on us to be there and to provide information. Similarly, families are watching. Um, families that we don't even know are watching from galleries, are watching online, are watching media reports. And so one of the ways that we can get good information out there so that families know there are psychologists and other mental health professionals out there protecting their rights and advocating for their mental health and well-being. 
Um, and so one particular example of that that I wanted to share um, is that in our most recent um, Texas legislative session, there were an outstanding, outrageous number of anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ bills filed, um, many of which sought to ban gender affirming care in a variety of ways, one of which would have been by, by labeling it as child abuse in our state law. Um, and so I was there to testify against that bill on behalf of the Texas Psychological Association. And it was important that I was, and as I was watching from the gallery, I heard other mental health professionals there licensed in the state of Texas talking to our legislators and giving bad information, giving outdated information that was 30 or 40 years old about transgender health care and about really, frankly, pathologizing trans people. Um, and so it was important then that I stood up representing the actual profession of psychology in a formal role and giving current data, current science, and talking about from a trauma-focused provider um, what true child abuse is and how that contrasts significantly to what gender-affirming care is, which promotes the mental health and well-being of young people. Um, so I really do want to emphasize it is important that we stand up, that we are there, that we are present. It does not have to be at the legislature if you can't make it in person, like Rose was referencing, sometimes she cannot be there in person. Um, but writing letters, making phone calls, um, it does matter when we are constituents and we take the time to write to our representatives and senators as a constituent and as a psychologist and a professional and tell them what science and data says and tell them about their other constituents and their mental health and well being. So I would encourage each of you to find your way to share your voice, share your message, and to speak up on behalf of our LGBTQ plus community um, and sharing the importance of mental health care for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Rose and Megan. It's really super to have your on the ground experience here to help inspire everybody to know that, look, it's just a matter of figuring out how to get involved and getting started. We're now going to turn it over to Claude, uh, to Doris uh, Parfait, Claude, uh, APA's Director for Grassroots Engagement, who will walk us through ways to engage with policymakers and make compelling cases to them. Thank you all. Indeed. So, everybody, nice to meet you. Glad to be here today. Um, I joined APA about seven or eight months ago um, to help with our grassroots efforts. And let me see if I can share my screen. And as Kim said, okay. and as Kim mentioned, I'm going to be um, talking about our how to engage and advocacy overall. Excuse me, I have to minimize the window here. There we go. So let's dive in with how to engage. We're going to cover today what kind of support you can expect and then break down types of action by the time they take and the effect they have on lawmakers. Now, in the poll that we took earlier today, a lot of you expressed a lot, certain amount, wanting a certain amount of help with your advocacy. So I want to start by reassuring you that no matter the issue, you are not alone. Organizations and coalitions have resources that you can use, like the ones that Sergio and Ron will be discussing com uh, coming up next. Organizations also have lobbyists and experts like Kate to guide you through the policy process, no matter your level of experience. In the next slides, we'll start by going over quick ways to engage and end with high value actions so you can get a sense of how to best use your time when you're advocating. If you're just beginning as an advocate, action alerts and social media are easy ways to get involved. One drawback is that these actions are often impersonal because many rely on pre-written messages so officials treat these actions like a temperature check. The more touches they get, the harder they think an issue is and the more they pay attention in case it comes up during election season. By engaging, you help increase the temperature. Activities like meetings or events are the next level up because they put your humanity in the forefront. They help dialogue, they help officials put a face to an issue and it gives them a chance to dialogue back with you. This will make them more likely to compromise with you naturally these activities are more time consuming, but they are very impactful. And finally, group activities like joint meetings or letters are very effective at getting policymakers' attention. Kate also mentioned testifying. They know how hard it is to find common ground amongst groups. So it's why getting that diversity of voices matters. Elected officials also see value in connecting to groups they do not usually engage with, but this takes more experience to conduct successfully. So now that we've, we have a bit more context on what engagement means, I have two main points. One, 
Your reasons for caring about an issue might be different from your officials. Take time to research them in advance and find common ground. Maybe they have a family member who is affected by the issue you're advocating on, or you did research on an issue that's important to them. Two, your advocacy will not exist in a vacuum. Turning to organizations and coalitions is how you get contexts such as political climate and opportunities to act. So now that we've covered ways to get your foot in the door, let's shift to making a compelling case. A pitch is just the beginning of a conversation. It's easy to feel as if each engagement you have with lawmakers is your only shot at swaying them, but you don't have to throw a bunch of facts at them in one go. Trust that you'll be able to educate them over time. Policy change is a lengthy process with many chances for follow-up. When you foster a two-way conversation, policymakers will be more willing to meet you again, even if they hold opposing beliefs. So let's talk about how to get the conversation started. Before you contact officials, Start thinking about the effect you want to have. It seems counterintuitive to focus on emotions when making a policy ask, but it's a good way to organize your information. For example, if you want to create a sense of wonder on a program, focus on uplifting anecdotes. You can rely on one pagers to run out the information later, but your pitch is about creating a human connection. The tips on this slide help you pick the direction you want to go in, but now we're going to shift and talk about how to stay on track once you have that conversation going. You'll want to keep things short. You might only have a few minutes to make your case while meeting in a hallway. You want to be brief to share the essentials up front and then expand if you have the chance. We have an appendix at the end of these slides with more guidelines on message length. Officials and their staff have limited bandwidth because they receive many competing demands. So you want to keep things simple. You might be meeting with early career staff in their 20s. They will not have expertise in the or issue. So you don't want to overwhelm them with technical information. And finally, concrete means giving specific examples. Be there about yourself, a patient, or your community. Anecdotes make a talking point come alive. Next, we'll run through examples of different pitches that use these guidelines. The, the scripts are also in the appendix because they've worked well as email templates. In this and the next examples, you would jump into your pitch after introducing yourself and stating your purpose. During the pandemic, I've been able to support more patients by leveraging remote technology. That's because at the start of COVID-19, the government instituted increased flexibilities around telehealth. For example, for the last two years, I've been able to offer phone meetings without having to require an in-person follow-up. This has made a huge difference for a lot of people. For example, one of my patients is a health worker struggling with everything she's seen during the pandemic. Her schedule is hectic and she barely has time to meet, much less travel back and forth to and from my office. I saw you worked as a nurse before running for office, so I'm sure you understand what that schedule can be like. Being able to call in from wherever she meet, wherever she is, means she doesn't have to sacrifice her well-being for her patients. Fortunately, once the pandemic ends, many of these regulatory flexibilities will go away unless Congress acts. Of course, my patient will continue to have very long shifts after the pandemic ends, especially since her hospital is now short-staffed. She told me that if we have to go back to the meeting in person, she would not be able to get help as often as she needs it. We need more flexibility to meet patients like her where they are. Bill would help by making the temporary changes in regulations permanent. Over 50 national organizations support this bill, including APA. I'd be very happy to share a copy of the letter with you, if that would be helpful. Would you be interested in co-sponsoring this legislation? So this example shows how you can draw a policymaker into your world and incorporate facts that you learned about them. It could be used when you're trying to prevent or mitigate unwelcome policies because it forces, focuses on real life consequences. This example, on the contrary, shows how you can encourage policymakers to embrace change. I am one of two psychologists in my clinic who speak Spanish, and we're desperately struggling to meet the needs of clients who do not speak English. It is heartbreaking to see our waiting lists grow because we do not have enough staff to schedule appointments. Not having more diversity is having real life implications for patients. When patients have to describe their challenges in a language they are not fluent in, might miss a key nuance or detail. That could affect the diagnosis and next steps we take. This legislation can help by creating more diverse pipelines into psychology. In my clinic alone, one more Spanish speaking psychology would reduce our waiting list by 20%. That means fewer families struggling with hunger because a parent is getting the treatment they need to stay in the workforce. More students in, the, in this district would be able to stay in school because budding conditions would be identified before developing into a crisis. What are your thoughts on introducing this legislation? 
So this example encourages change by creating a sense of what is versus what could be, and shows officials their role in creating a brighter future. Some of you are represented by officials who hold a more influential role. This sample pitch focuses on the policymakers' importance. We are really facing mental health crisis among youth in our state. Recently, I started seeing a teenage girl who's struggling with depression. Even just to request a meeting with me, she struggled with months of self-doubt. She didn't know who to ask for for help, how to get it, and she couldn't rely on her parents to help navigate the process. Every day, she was at risk for self-harm. I was grateful that I was able to start seeing her when I did, but many adolescents in our state are not getting the help they need in time. In fact, we've seen a significant increase in the rate of teen suicide. We're coming to you because as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, you're in a unique position to work with your colleagues on a solution. Here's a list of policies developed by the American Psychological Association with support from several other organizations to help address youth mental health. We would love your support to turn this into a reality. It would have a huge impact on our state in helping youth get the support they need. Are these policies something that you would consider supporting? Good audiences for this pitch are chairs of key committees or officials who officially own an issue in their delegation. You may need their support to get your proposal off the ground, and this pitch gives them a sense of buy-in. Advocacy can also mean serving as an ambassador for a program, research, or policy. In this case, describing your own career path or personal experience is very effective. I first became interested in helping people in my senior year of high school. A friend was having a really tough time after his parents divorced, but I could see how talking about it made him feel better. That sense of connection and helpfulness drove me to take an intro to psychology class in college. From there on out, I knew I had found my career. But a PhD could mean a decade of balancing school with life in general and accruing a huge amount of debt. I had to pay my own way through the entirety of my studies. The psychology entry grants program made a huge difference for me during that time. It gave paid training opportunities so I could build on my knowledge while earning a living. That helped me get past a big barrier to entry. I now lead a program that helps 1,500 people in rural communities every year. There are plenty like me who could make a difference in people's lives if they could only benefit from a program such as this one. This program now desperately needs funding. Do you think your office would be willing to support its renewal? Policymakers love hearing real life examples. They use them in speeches or to convince colleagues to co-sponsor a bill. So far, our examples have focused on personal or client experiences, but you can use your ties to local institutions to establish your credentials. And this is our final example um, of a pitch. The hospital that I work at is the single largest employer for North County and the only hospital within reach of the Northeast and Northwest counties. This year alone, we supported 300 patients experiencing a mental health crisis. Unfortunately, this has taken a huge toll on our staff. Many are burnt out and many have left. If we cannot recruit more staff, we might have to close the program entirely. This document lists two solutions that would help us both recruit and retain new staff. With these policies, we can keep helping these 300 people and maybe even take on more patients. Would you be able to support these bills? This kind of pitch works because policymakers want to check the pulse of their communities. By explaining the reach of your organization and their constituency, you can build trust. If you follow up often, they might start relying on your insights. So these examples give you a sense of what information you might need before engaging with officials. That's why I'm reasserting the point about an organizations that I made earlier in the presentation. But I hope these examples also show how irreplaceable you are. Your insights and your experiences provide color in a way no one else can. If all this has given you energy, we have an opportunity for you to practice. The advocacy office is collecting stories on youth mental health needs. We are looking for examples we can give to elected officials when they ask for them. You can practice writing your insights on the youth mental health crisis in a pitch format and submit them through the link portal. Advocacy is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. So I hope you'll stay in touch with AP, the APA Advocacy Office. We've included this slide so you know how to engage with us in the future. These slides will be available after the event so you'll have access to the links. And now I'll turn it over to Sergio Dominguez who will talk about their work to help update APA's web-based resources for 2022. Thank you again for having me here. 
Thank you so much, Doris, for sharing with us all some, uh, I think, really tangible steps that we can um, take to making positive social change. And I feel super excited to now begin to share with you all some web-based resources for advocacy and activism. Uh, my name is Sergio Dominguez, and I use they, them pronouns. I am a queer, trans, multiracial, Latina doctoral student in counseling psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I am also Xochiwa which is a Nahua specific uh, two-spirit identity. I'm currently located on occupied Ho-Chunk land um, and I want to um, acknowledge, honor, um, and uh, tribute to um, Ho-Chunk people's past and present. And I also want to invite us all um, in this space together to continue working toward paying reparations to local native populations. So, during the fall 2021 semester, I took a course on mental health consultation in health service psychology. And as part of that course, Dr. Mindy Thompson supervised my consultation work with APA, through which I updated information on the web-based advocacy resources web pages to reflect information and languaging that we hope will be useful for 2022. And additionally, I revamped background information and talking points to more clearly be intersectional in nature, attending specifically to ableist, adultist, and anti-Black underpinnings of ongoing queer and trans policy and legislation issues. At the end of my pro bono work with APA, I provided several recommendations and future directions for this work. These include conducting program evaluation to understand the specific tangible impact that the web pages have on grassroots, state level, and federal level advocacy and policy issues. Um, and as well as to understand um, and to strategize how to expand uh, our audience and impact as it relates to the web pages. Additionally, I recommend continued expansion of the web pages to include additional topics impacting LGBTQ plus communities. Uh, some specific ideas that I have for topics include sex work and sex work decriminalization, immigration and asylum seeking processes, substance use and substance use decriminalization, housing and access to housing, uh, access to and retention of disability related resources and benefits, and honestly, many, many others. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Now, since I have the mic, I also want to uh, take the opportunity to invite APA to continue supporting citizen psychologists uh, and psychologist activists, uh, which can be accomplished through sponsoring skills building workshops such as this one, um, and to increase accessibility, particularly for multiply marginalized psychologists. Um, I recommend that these workshops offer continuing ed education credits, that they be free of charge, that they be hosted outside of business hours, that they continue to be hosted virtually, that they be recorded and available to participants indefinitely, and that they include uh, closed captioning and audio transcription. I also want to invite APA to offer specific guidance regarding the roles psychologists may take in activism and advocacy, including but not limited to APA guidelines for activism and advocacy for psychologists, as well as ethical guidelines for engaging in activism and advocacy. And then finally, I want to invite APA to create and enact ethical and legal protections for psychologists engaging in activism and advocacy. Now, some of these recommendations um, that I have come up with also mirror recommendations that some colleagues and I um, provide in a recent article that we wrote for the American Psychologist. Um, I am pasting some links to some of that work in the chat and you all can check it out there. And ultimately, my hope is that these recommendations will serve as a step for psychology and for APA to continue toward working toward making a positive impact on critical social issues. Um, with that, uh, Ron and Katie, I would really love it if you all would walk us through an overview of these um, web-based advocacy resources. 
Thank you, Sergio. It was a real pleasure to work with you on this and your timing when you were available and your particular areas of interest were just such a perfect match for right when we needed it to get content updated as we headed into 2020. As Kate sort of outlined, this has been growing over the past few years. And when we entered 2021, uh, we had background content that was relevant at the time. Clearly 2021 brought us a different, to a different place by 2022. And having uh, you be able to help us with that, when you were able to help us with that, really put us in place to enter 2022 well prepared. Um, so now, uh, Kim just put, or I'm sorry, uh, we're, we're putting the link to the state advocacy resources in the, in the chat while uh, Katie shares her screen. And we will start with an overview of how the resources are structured. Okay, so first we have this lovely banner. And as we scroll down a little bit below that, go ahead on a bit further you'll see that we've got different topic tiles. These are some, don't have to do that, hold that there for the moment. Um, you see that we've got uh, a, a topic that deals with bans on um, sexual orientation change efforts. There's a tile on the criminalization of affirmative care. There's a tile on religious freedom, so-called, uh, in terms of, um, you know, basically ways that folks can opt out of uh, providing equal services. There is one on trans youth in sports. There is one on universal bathrooms where um, that, you know, bathrooms no longer have, you know, just the boy and the girl on the front, but that, um, that we recognize that restrooms need to be available to not only trans folks, but, you know, people that have kids, people that um, are uh, assisting elderly people. There's a whole lot of reasons why uh, a universal approach to restrooms is useful. And then the new uh, resource for this year is the one that you see there next, which is um, interestingly, you'll see these are all marked as either favorable or unfavorable. This particular one can be go can go either way. Um, it's about um, LGBT inclusive curriculum, uh, be it across everything from you know mathematics and history to sex education. And as we're seeing in Florida in particular right now, um, this is really salient and. Depends, you know, different times along the way, we've seen efforts to um, uh, enact policies that would require inclusive education. And then we also see the pendulum swing the other way. So then scrolling down a bit further, there are a handful of resources about gauge, engaging in advocacy. Uh, following on the resource that you shared, here's a really great article written by Kevin Nadal that really sort of spells out the role of psychologists uh, uh, in advocating for social justice while maintaining their professional responsibilities and ethical boundaries. It's an excellent hand, below that, there's a really excellent handbook on how psychologists can engage in advocacy. Um, it's, it was, uh, it's, it was uh, written by re representatives from, I believe it was four, at least four different uh, APA divisions um, and with a CODAPAR grant, CODAPAR grant and it, it really does a wonderful job of explaining how and why psychologists can get involved with advocacy and the you know, unique and important voice they bring. The next two items are some brief advocacy sheets from the Texas Psychological Association that kind of summarize a lot of some of these more extended resources. So then scrolling back up, there was, I saw a question about some of this in the chat. So scrolling back up and looking on the right hand column, you'll find links to important information and networking resources. If you want to find out what your state association may be doing uh, to help and how you can help, there's a, a link to find out you know, how to access your state associations. Um, if you want to track what's happening state by state, you can use the Freedom for All Americans tracker. That way you can go in and check every, you know, your own state or what's going on nationally with trends with LGBT related uh, legislation. The next, a little further down, the Equality Federation link can help you connect with your state's leading advocacy networks. Um, the Equality Federation, there's Equality, Flo Equality Florida, for example, that I know is doing remarkable work right now with everything they're facing. And they've been working for years to create networks uh, across um, you know, interests across business. Um, so those are really a wonderful way to plug in and figure out how you can bring the unique voice of your own as a constituent as well as a psychologist and see where that fits in the broader strategy. 
Among the links a little further down is the one to the HRC page, Laws and Legislation, which also is a great way to get updates on what's going on. We're not gonna go all over all of these uh, links, but invite you to take a, to visit the site and explore them. So next, we're gonna take a look at how the content is organized in the specific issue tiles. Since the efforts to ban affirmative care with trans minors is such a hot issue right now, we'll take a look at that as a sample. So Kate, if you'll click on through that one, um, there's some minor variations in, in some of the con and how some of the content is presented on these pages, but this will give you the idea. As you click through and scroll down, you'll see it begins with a background section that provides overview and context for the issue. When moving down uh, to the, when, when, when we then move down to a section of recommended, recommend, recommended discussion points that can be used for helping write letters or testimony or for use in visits with lawmakers and their staff. Now, leaning on what psychology can specifically bring, each of these uh, discussion points uh, includes one or more citations grounded in science. So you can consider what talking points, to, as you consider what uh, um, discussion points to emphasize, be mindful of the overall coalition messaging strategies and your specific audience. So then scrolling down a little further, uh, the reference list is provided from everything that's listed uh, in, the in the discussion points. And then continuing down, you'll find a range of issue specific resources from APA and other respected sources, um, starting with, an, uh, yeah, uh, with other sources. We're going, going to soon have uh, a PDF version of this page, somewhat abbreviated, that will be available to be printed out that can be shared with lawmakers when visiting in person. Then finally, scrolling back up, you see in this section there uh, to the right, high, right side column, uh, there's more related resources. In this instance, it starts with an op-ed by last year's APA president, Jennifer Kelly, um, talking about the importance of a science-based perspective on deciding what's appropriate for uh, care for minors. This is followed by various articles and examples of advocacy from, in this case, uh, from the Arkansas Psychological Association. So we'll leave it to you to explore the other sections. But that gives you an idea of how to navigate the, these resource pages and what you will find. We now hand it back over to Kim. All right, thanks Ron and Katie for that overview. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters at this point for everything that you've shared with us and our audience today. Um, thanks everyone for being able to stay for the next segment. We're gonna transition now over into the Q&A and uh, use the remainder of our time to dig deeper with our presenters and respond to any questions that you might have. You can ask a question of a specific presenter or to the panel um, to just respond as they wish. And um, we, again, wanna end about 10 minutes early to give you a break between meetings. So it looks like we have maybe about a half hour or so. Um, I will ask Katie then, what do you have for us? Hi everyone, I am Katie Trotta. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I live on Chumash and Saline and land. I'm here in the lovely state of California. I am happy to um, moderate your questions and answers. We got quite a few in the chat. Thank you for that. I am going to direct some of them to somebody specifically or leave them up to all of our panelists. Some of them overlap quite a bit. Um, some of them might be a little more pointed. So thank you everybody for all of your questions. We might not get to all of them, but I, um, they're all wonderful. So first I'd like to kind of point a question to Kate um, about what are kind of the important things to say and not to say, particularly when um, talking or trying to legislate to a conservative legislator, this person specifically asked. And I'd also like um, Megan and Rose to kind of follow up with that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll start by saying that, uh, you know, even legislators who are conservative have a reason that they ran for office. 
Now, sometimes, I mean, I know that it's really hard and you look at some of these politicians and you think like just truly what on earth could we possibly have in common? And I am not going to tell you that you can find common ground with every single one of these people because truly some of them you will not. But um, it is a really good place to start and, and sort of establishing that connection. And that doesn't matter if they're conservative or liberal, right? Like they're there for a reason. And, um, you know, I do want to emphasize, and, and I thought that this was a really, really well done in Doris's presentation, that there are so many different ways that you can engage from the 15 seconds to the multiple days, right? And what I would recommend is if you're going to do anything more than the 15 seconds, have 30 of, spend 30 seconds Googling the person and just find out what it is that they say they care about, right? And if they say that they care deeply about, you know, the three blocks and and where they grew up, or like they care deeply about X or Y, was that whatever, find a way that you can try to connect with them about something that you care about that overlaps with them. And that doesn't matter, conservative, um, liberal, whatever, right? Like that just is sort of across the board. That said, you're obviously going to have a different message depending on who you're going to talk to because that's part of the point, right? Is you wanna have a personal conversation and a personal connection with someone so that you can help take them from where they are and move them maybe just a couple clicks down the road. So what does that mean um, in practice? One of the things that I love to hear from uh, mental health professionals when when folks are testifying is really clarifying that the many stresses and I, i'm going to talk about trans kids just because they're the folks that have been the most attacked during this ledge session but when you talk about how you know there are all of these really negative mental health outcomes for trans youth as a result of um, all of the sort of different pressure to just really sort of differentiate right it's not that trans youth are born feeling depressed and anxious necessarily. It's that all of the transphobia that we're throwing at them, that is coming at them from every different direction is making them depressed and anxious. <laughs> and I, that may sound like really obvious to this group, but there are people out there who just fundamentally believe that trans kids are broken. And so getting into that narrative and saying like, no, trans kids are great, it's the transphobia that's breaking things, that is a really, really helpful thing to say. And, uh, you know, I think Megan mentioned this as well, but like the messenger matters so much. And so to come from the standpoint that you all are coming from, I would say think about two audiences if you're providing live testimony. Think about the legislator that you're trying to convince and what is going to resonate with them. And then also think about the trans kid five rows back in the room or like streaming at home <laughs> and see if you can include messages for both of them, right? So both trans kids are great and you're going to have a great life and you're wonderful and everything that these people are saying about you is wrong. And also everything that people are saying about trans kids is wrong because actually it's not the kids that are the problem, right? It is the, the transphobia that they're, they're set on. And, um, and so I think like those things are really helpful and just, I, you know, it is really different, different. Each of these bills is really hard. So I could like lay out specific talking points for each of the bills and it does change. But if you are working with an advocacy group and Ron did a great job of listing out like so who some of the players are in these states, if you're working with an advocacy group, they can give you talking points on the bill. You don't need to be a legislative expert. Like, I just really, really want to emphasize that. You do not need to be an expert on analyzing policy in order to have a really important role in this conversation. Someone else can give you the talking points, and then you can go in and say, this is how these talking points work from my perspective. Um, I am an expert on X, Y, and Z. I care about this issue because of ABC and then deliver the talking points that, that work the best for you. So please don't feel intimidated. Like this, this actually should be a fairly easy entry point, um, no matter what the bill is, whether it's a conservative legislature or a liberal one. And frankly, we need you in the conservative ones, even if they are scary, that's where we need you the most. Megan, do you want to talk on this real quick? 
Yeah, I'll just echo the point that Kate made about, you know, looking at who your audience is, right, and seeing what are the, what are their interest areas. So one of the ways that I'm able to talk, even in a conservative state like Texas, is through a trauma-informed care lens. So Texas, for a number of years, has had a bunch of different trauma-focused kind of um, initiatives, legislatively, statewide. And so because I also am a trauma-focused uh, provider and researcher, and therapists, that is my lens and my entrance point to talk about the disproportionate rates of trauma that impact LGBTQ plus kids, and then how that, you know, impacts mental health. And so, you know, I think about messaging to more conservative folks, they're concerned about like fiscal responsibility, right? So I can talk about utilization of emergency rooms and hospitals and criminal justice systems, as opposed to preventative mental health care. And so, so it's thinking about what are those messages that resonate with your audience and just tailoring your message to that. The good news is, is mental health really isn't a partisan issue. And so that is one of the great ways that we as psychologists do have the ability to talk with anybody, either side of the aisle, right, is because mental health, everybody knows somebody who has some kind of mental health struggle. And so relating to it at that personal level, which is what we are best at and best trained to do is a great avenue to talk with any audience. Rose, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would I would agree with that, that we we stay in our lane, right? Our purpose is to represent psychology and the um, scientific side of psychology, because um, of course there are always psych people can represent themselves as psychologists and they're not um, in step with the rest of the field. Um, yeah, so our lane is improving mental health and reducing risk of suicide. And you can't, you know, it, it would, it would be hard to find any kind of politician who's going to be in favor of more mental illness and in favor of suicide. Uh, so I've, I've practiced in the state for almost 30 years. This is a very conservative state. I've taught in this state for 18 years, most of that time doing um, uh, teaching uh, human sexuality, which is a required course. So I'm used to the students sitting in the back with the arm folded. But again, I just I stay in my lane. Uh, somebody mentioned avoiding the jargon which I think is a good idea. I'm very good at just draining blood out of the language and saying people tend to have better mental health outcomes when they feel supported by their communities. And people generally aren't gonna argue with that. Of course, what I wanna say is there's a special place in hell for people who score cheap political points off the back of trans kids. But I say that when I get home. Oh, that's fantastic, Rose, I love it. Okay, I have a question for Sergio, and there was a couple of students on the chat, which is great to see. How could young activists, clinical PsyD students, counseling, what, what have you, um, be more involved at the federal or state level? Um, several people indicated that they would like, that they are students and are looking to get more involved. Sergio, what would you recommend? I so appreciate this question and also feel just generally very enthused about the fact that there are students in this room because we literally are the future of psychology and it makes me so incredibly pleased to know that there are um, so many activists that are coming up and will someday hold these positions of power and hopefully create so much change in our field and in this organization because I think it is it's time and I think these organizations the, the field is ready. Um, I think to that end, one of the things that I did notice as um, a question was I think particularly around holding marginalized identities and multiple marginalized identities. And I think to that end, it feels important to name the fact that so much of my activism and advocacy actually is stuff that I will never get credit for. And it's stuff that like people like in general in the broad population will not see because for me, it is a lot safer to move silently. And for me, it is a lot safer to instead have like my like cis people, my straight people, my like white people like on speed dial and say like, hey, there's this thing that just came up. I need you to do something about it, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna need receipts. I'm gonna need to know what exactly it is that you did and to have proof that you did this thing, right? And so I think to that end, um, really being in community um, and being in community with allies feels super important because the fact of the matter is that I am, I'm a trans person of color. Like if I show up to like a random thing, like where there could be opposition, where there could be violence, there is a high likelihood that I could get murdered. And so I think to that end, um, it feels really important for me to like preserve my physical and my mental well-being. Um, 
because if something were to happen to me, then it would have so many ripples, particularly around the like queer and trans minors that I'm working with and the affirming care that I'm providing for them. And so for me, it's really important to like self-preserve and to view my self-preservation as a radical act of defiance toward these systems that frankly don't want us here um, and frankly don't want us to be existing. And so yeah, calling, calling like my white people, right? And being like, hey, do this thing or like the stray um, or the people that like I know are on my team calling them and having them showing up to protests or showing up to um, spaces that frankly I would not have access to. It also feels important to name the fact that as students, as a student, we don't have the same amount of power and privilege that faculty members would have or that full members of APA might have. And so to that end, I also want to um, invite like the students on the call or like the multiple marginalized people on the call to do um, a lot of coalescence building, right? There is, I think, a lot of strength in numbers. And I think that like, it feels very different to come up to like a faculty member or to departments, academic systems as one person versus as a group of people who want to create some sort of meaningful change. And so to that end, um, yeah, coalescence building, plugging into communities, and um, yeah, in general, getting plugged in to, to spaces such as, such as this one and doing work such as the work that I've done that will have ripples and will ripple out and where we do get these platforms to be able to say the things that we wanna say and to have these be calls to action, right? Because activism and advocacy can look as so much more than like just hitting the streets, right? Hitting the streets is important. Contacting like lawmakers and legislators is really important and showing up in person um, to do these things is important and the behind the scenes work is equally important and so I think sometimes whenever we don't hold as much privilege as some of the people around us doing that behind the scenes work can be so important and can still make like really beautiful change um, and I, I feel genuinely um, pleased and proud um, that uh, I do get to, to do this work even if my name like won't get attached to like all this work because I don't need that um, I don't need for people broadly or whatnot to like get to know me or to know my name. For me, what's important is for like my communities to know me. And so I want to invite um, particularly graduate students and multiply marginalized folks. Like if your communities know you, you're all set. You're doing something. Great. Thank you, Sergio. I think this is a good question for Doris. Um, and there was kind of some of multiple questions related to this of what's the best way to determine which type of advocacy to use you kind of laid out some different like really quick ones versus longer contacts right increasing the temperature so which is the best way to determine the best strategy for um this for advocacy in any situation i know it's really vague and it's kind of but i thought you might be able to to head on that doris Absolutely. Um, so there's kind of different ways that you can get around to it. If you're acting on, if you're basically kind of just starting out and you're kind of trying to get a sense of what works for you, start with the lighter stuff and then have somebody come with you to something more um, elaborate. So if it's your first time meeting with a lawmaker, you don't have to go in it solo. You know, there's organizations that will be doing Hill Days, they'll be doing outreach. Join in, kind of sit around, listen, see what works for you um and speak up when you're ready and again as Kate said we don't you don't need to be a policy expert you're the expert in you you're the expert in your life and that's what they need to hear like lawmakers want to hear from their constituents they want to know what's happening in the real world and you are the real world very much so um so start small get a sense of what you're comfortable with and then start joining on to group activities and eventually you'll have the resources and the supports to be able to go in and go solo um, Excellent. And while I'm coming up with our next question, I'd also say join your local state um, association. I bet you, Megan and Rose, would bo both say that a lot of um, state advocacy, their your psychological association has an advocacy center, and they do hill days and things like that. Um, that was one of the big questions in the in the tab. As we're wrapping up, we have about ten more minutes to answer questions. Um, Kate, there was a lot of inf questions about how to get. Um, that weekly stakeholder report. Could you just um, tell us how to do that real quick? Sure, you can send me an email. I'll, um, 
and I can get you hooked up with it. Um, it my email address is my name, Catherine.oakley at hrc.org. So that's C A T H R Y N dot Oakley, O A K L E Y at hrc.org. And uh, I'll make sure that you get added to our list. Um, and the other thing that you could do is we also tweet out our, our quote unquote terrible 10 each week. So you can see the 10 states where the things are, are bubbling up the worst. Um, so if you follow HRC on Twitter, you'll see those. We usually do them Monday or Tuesday. Um, so uh, those are out there. And um, you can also, yes, I can I can type it into the chat as well. Um, and then also you can always follow me on Twitter. I'm always uplifting all of the stuff that's happening in the States too. Great, thanks, Kate. Um, a couple of people have asked, and I think Megan and Rose can talk about this, um, as multiple identities of like, we're psychologists, we're advocacy people. There's some ethical questions about that too in the chat um, and Q&A of like, how is it better for us to come forward as constituents, as psychologists, um, as um, like Sergio recommended, sometimes this affects me individually or this affects my child or my loved one. Um, how, how is best to kind of navigate these multiple identities and these multiple professional personal roles? Um, Megan and Rose, how do you, how do you both do that? Well, I'd say yes, yes to all, right? Because <laughs> um, all of our identities matter in our advocacy work, right? Um, so, I mean, first thing, just like from a practical standpoint, for those who work in agencies, in hospitals and academic settings, you're going to have government affairs people representing those groups that you're going to have to coordinate with when you do advocacy um, and making sure that you're not representing your organization if you don't have the authority to do so. So that's a really important part just to kind of put out there. So if you are not kind of given the authority to represent, say, your university, then you need to, as part of your advocacy, say, I'm representing myself. And then you choose, you know, do you want to be talking about your personal experiences? Do you want to say, I am a licensed psychologist and a mother, parent, sibling, whatever, right? Um, and I think, again, that's where your audience matters and who you're talking to. I'll also just be frank is that safety matters, right? Sergio highlighted that well. Um, that matters for those of us in states that are conservative and where there are attacks currently ongoing towards parents and psychologists and community members who are speaking out and protecting kids. Um, so we do wanna be mindful of safety risks for yourself and also self-care is an important part of advocacy. And that's something we talked about uh, the other day, kind of preparing for this is that especially when we, hold marginalized and minoritized identities and are doing advocacy that it is so important to be sure that you've got your supports behind you um, that are helping you take care of yourself to do this work. And so figuring out which lens, which role, which title you use, also consider what is best for you as a person um, to be able to sustain this in the long run. What about you, Rose? Anything else to add? Yeah, I would say, yeah, it does. It is, um, it would depend whether or not you check on with your employer. My, uh, I work for the university and they're very comfortable with me doing advocacy. My clinical employer has kind of said, yeah, just don't ask because then we'd have to, you know, get it approved by the office of, you know, approving whatever it is you do on your, on your um, off hours. Uh, so I just don't do it on their time, but I do know what the policies are and I know it doesn't violate the policies. So uh, when I do advocacy, it's always as a part of my state association because my state association kind of shares a brain, which is very handy. Um, Cause again, there's not that many of us and we all you know, know each other from grad school. Uh, Megan's association, you may not, it sounds like you have, you have uh, more diversity of opinion for, again, the kind of bloodless language there. Uh, so if you can represent your state association, then that's useful because it, then it's just not one random psychologist. Um, yeah, so again, even though I know the advocacy I do doesn't violate any policies at my place of work, there's still the issue that a client could recognize me and say, gee, what were you doing saying that thing? I have a bit of cover because I could always say, hey, it's what the state uh, association told me to do. And it's never happened because people really don't pay attention, but it, but it could at some point. Um, yeah. And there is the issue of your, your name may not end up on it. When I've written letters of, to the editor, it's never my name. It's the name of the um, president of our state association. 
but I kind of enjoy it. It's kind of like ding dong ditching people, right? I mean, nobody knew, knows that you were actually behind it, uh, but it is something to consider and everybody's situation will vary. Absolutely. So we have just a few minutes left. I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. There were more that we weren't able to get to. I want to encourage you. Um, most of our contact information should be on the slides that you'll get. Feel free to, to reach out to individuals um, if you have questions for them. If not, reach out to Ron, uh, me or Kim, and we are happy to direct you as well and Doris as well. Um, those of us who are more linked to APA directly. Um, but I'm going to post the second poll and have you guys take a second guys. I'm sorry. I keep using guys. I'm from California. Y'all I need to start saying y'all. I apologize for my gendered language and seeing as we increase, um, see how everybody is. Oh, I can see it and it's very exciting. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's so exciting, Ron and Kim. Awesome. Yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Who doesn't like instant gratification? That was like the most fantastic. exciting part of my week right here. I love it. That's fantastic. This is great. This is really great. Uh, thanks to everybody for participating in the poll. This is great. So Ron, you're gonna wrap us up. Um, Kim, you're up next there. Yes, absolutely, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, Katie just kind of let us in uh, into the poll, which was awesome. But just to thank everybody, thank you, Katie, for navigating the questions and thanks to the presenters and to everybody for engaging and participating. We really hope you found this webinar informative and helpful, uh, whether you're just getting started on your advocacy journey or you consider yourself more seasoned in this work. Um, we're really uh, very appreciative for everyone who joined us today. Great. And I'm about to post in the chat. Um, let me just do it right now. Well, I'm, here it is. This is what I promised early on. It is the meeting with a purpose that APA has adopted, particularly with this idea of ending a, me a meeting a few minutes early, so everybody has time to take care of themselves in between. And I must tell you, while this was scheduled to end at five o'clock, we're gonna end 10 minutes early at least, and I have a meeting that starts right at five o'clock. So I'm personally grateful for this. Um, that brings us to the end of our time. Once again, we wanna thank everyone involved in today's webinar and to all of you who took the time to join us. We hope you found it informative and useful and that you feel better prepared to engage uh, in advocacy on LGBT issues in your state. And from the polls, uh, I think we can all feel pretty good that you feel like you're in a much better spot. Um, this has been our pleasure to develop these resources for, uh, for you and we look forward to your thoughts on how they can be expanded and improved upon. Please visit the pages after today's program to give them a closer read. Um, you'll also soon receive an email with information on the opportunity to practice your pitches through the Youth Mental Health Storytelling Portal. And lastly, before we go, as noted at the beginning, once the webinar closes, you'll be given an opportunity to respond to a brief survey. We look forward to your thoughts about today's presentation. We would greatly appreciate your feedback as we work to continue to develop additional resources. And with that, thanks again and best wishes for empowering and impactful ad adventures in advocacy. Thank you.